Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test for Our channel. This week's review is due to a recommendation from a listener for a steampunk series I had never heard of. The first book appeared in 2018, so you won't find it on any of those steampunk lists you see online. I do need to compile my own, don't I? And most of those lists pretty much end at 2014, so they don't get any of the good new stuff that's out there. It immediately reminded me of The Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences by Pip Ballantyne and T. Morris. Unlike that series, which focuses on a secret agency of the British Imperial government, it is uniquely American in setting, characters, and style. The name is Steamcap, a multi-book offering from a guy named J.T. Murphy. If you search for Steam Cap on Amazon, you will find a whole bunch of these cosmetic things that women put on their heads to straighten curly hair. So you've got to search Steam Cap Murphy. Even if you spell it with a double P on the end, Amazon is weird. You know, they they only want to promote things that people have paid to be promoted. So anyway, Steam Cap is actually an acronym which signifies Strategic Tactics and Extraordinary Consultation and Protection Partnership. In truly American fashion, this is a private company, and they work for hire, essentially. The story begins in 1901, which being past the death of Queen Victoria is not in the Victorian era. However, this is America, so who cares? It's part of the Gilded Age, so to speak. And... My own definition of steampunk era is a little different. However, I'm not going to go into this right now. I will have to do a video about that at some point. What I define steampunk as kind of an expanded Victorian era. Now, I don't have much info on J.T. Murphy, except that he lives in the Adirondack region of northern New York. He is self-published. His day job is as a caregiver or something involving uh, a, a facility for disabled adults. Currently, the Steam Cap books are the only ones on Amazon that he has. Although his profile does mention that he has a fantasy work in progress, which is going to be completely different from this stuff. Murphy's series follows a successful and very enjoyable formula in which the two main protagonists are a man and a woman, both unattached which at some point may turn into romance, or at least some sexual tension. In this case, the two are Kyrian McKenna, who is both a hardened war veteran and a dandy and a very sharp dresser, <laughs> codenamed Piper, and 18-year-old Emma Derhart, codenamed Banshee, uh, who is a very beautiful yet deadly young woman. Rounding out the team is the genius a uh, white-haired old fellow, Dr. Balthazar Watt, and the Rescue Automaton Model 7, also known as RA-7, which is like a seven-foot-tall robot who walks and talks and has opinions of his own. The story begins in the Adirondack Mountain region of northern New York, which is an area that obviously Mr. Murphy knows well. It is refreshing to have a steampunk happening somewhere other than a big urban center like London or New York. What happens is a gang of anarchist terrorists kidnaps Gladys Vanderbilt, the younger sister of Alfred, who is the heir to the Vanderbilt fortune, which is built on railroads and shipping and so on. And this area makes sense because this northern part of New York was kind of a playground for the wealthy and famous at this time. And so that's what happens. The the bad guys take her to hide out in the mountains up here, and they're holding her for the ransom, the astronomical figure at that time, of $1 million in silver. Why silver specifically, you may ask? It's a good question. At the time, uh, silver versus gold was a big debate, and there was a very heated political idea as whether money should be based on one or the other, rather than just this nonsense paper we have right now. Uh, so. 
I kind of I kind of saw it as being that. I didn't read anything else into it. But it turns out there is. <laughs> now, even if they pay the ransom, the family is worried that these guys, being as ruthless as they are, will just simply execute her, take the money and just you know, dump her body somewhere because obviously they don't want her to identify any of them. So they hire Steam Cap to both rescue the young lady, she's like 13 or something, I believe, and to bring the villains to justice. As in any good steampunk setting, this world features an alternate historical reality. In this case, it's just a little different, which is kind of the way I like to do my steampunk. But, you know, everybody's different. Some are vastly different. Some are only slightly different. In this case, the U.S. did not fight Spain in 1898. Instead, they fought Britain. And so the war spilled over from the Canadian border, which is still technically independent, uh, but dominated by the British, of course. Now, in this case, there was a horrible war, and there were actually uh, concentration camps and all this. It was, was a, uh, I think, reminiscent of the Boer War, which was fought in South Africa at around that time. And so Teddy Roosevelt got involved, but instead of charging up San Juan Hill with his Rough Riders, he charged up Cobb Hill, which was in occupied Rochester. And, of course, there are airships. There are military airships. There are private airships, which, again, opposing reality happened a lot earlier than airships really became popular. Of course, Steam Cap has one that was devised by Dr. Watt. And this one flies neither by hydrogen nor helium, but by hot air. As the rescue mission unfolds, our heroes encounter additional mysteries. What is the secret of the archaeological dig where the rebels have taken the heiress? And they have killed a lot of the researchers and they've taken some of them hostage and so on. It may just be that this is convenient. You know, they can send out this lady to negotiate with them. What is the origin of the giant, fierce grizzly bear that seems to be attacking people in that area? I mean, grizzlies are not native to northern New York. How did it get there? Uh, and, and is it connected somehow to what's happening? Is there a more sinister plot in motion? There's one fascinating subplot that concerns St. Brendan the Navigator, another thing I had never heard of. Uh, but he was an Irish monk. And by the name Murphy, you would expect that uh, he would have good knowledge of Irish history. Supposedly, St. Brendan traveled with a group of other monks to America between 512 and 530 AD. Though legend says he discovered a flat and warm place, which most scholars think if it did happen, it must have been Florida. In this case, however, Brendan discovered northern New York. <laughs> Perhaps he sailed up the Hudson. We don't know. This is one of the things that the archaeologists are supposedly investigating up there. Now, the first book in the series, Steam Cap, the Adirondack Affair, and I have to note there's a little bit of a discrepancy here. The first one is Steam Cap, the Adirondack Affair, and the second one is the Adirondack Adventure, as if it's the same series. And then it's book one, The Rising of the Moon, and the second one is book two, Air Lords of the Adirondacks. So these were published respectively in 2018 and 2021. Again, self-published. And uh, Murphy does not have any cute, cutesy publishing company name, as I do. <laughs> he just says, uh, copyright J.T. Murphy. The third release is a Halloween-themed novella called Phantasmagoria, also released in 2021. It appears that the author intends to continue the series, which is cool. Now, earlier I compared it to the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences, which I will hereafter call MOPO uh, by Pip Ballantyne and T. Morris. There are enough similarities that the fans of one would be fans of the other, but not so many that you would consider it a ripoff. So I will be doing a lot of comparisons as I go over the pros and cons between the two series. And... Again, I think that there are some distinctions that make it uniquely interesting that it's not just like a continuation of, of their sort of work. Now, the first pro is the characters. Much as in Mopo, where I love the characters, they're a lot of 
fun. And that one, they again had a man and a woman who ended end up getting married. Now, at this point, there's nothing so far between them. Kirian's been a perfect gentleman to Emma, although he is kind of solicitous. You know, he's a bit of a male chauvinist, as would be expected at the time. He is dashing in vain. And again, he's a war veteran. He's a crack shot. But he's also very into men's fashion and very into the finer things in life, like good cigars and whiskey. His codename Piper is supposedly associated with the Pied Piper of Hamelin, though we're not quite sure how that came about. Maybe that'll be explained more later. Emma is an orphan girl who Kirian rescued from the streets. She was in a workhouse, and it was pretty abusive. You know, they were working her all the time, and, and she ran away, and, and she is a quick study, and she learns all these uh, techniques of killing. <laughs> she can shoot pretty well, too. And uh, she is also into being a daredevil, or a daredevilress, as he likes to describe her. She does things like tightrope walking across Niagara Falls, which is pretty intimidating. She adopts the codename Banshee, which is after the Irish ghost. Again, an Irish theme. The Irish ghost, which was the last thing you see before you die, which is, since she's kind of an assassin, this fits her quite well. And the next one is Balthazar Watt. He's this uh, elderly genius, long white hair. He's uh, invented all these things, and he's always groaning on and lecturing about science, which kind of bores people. <laughs> and they have to tell him to stop. <laughs> he also likes to quote the Bible, and he's a little bit judgmental on that on that uh, respect. Finally, we have the metal man, RA7, who is kind of interesting. He has a rather human personality. He's kind of taken after taken after Kirigan, and he really likes to charm the ladies. And, in fact, he develops a bit of a crush on one of the women that they rescue in the story, which is, which is pretty funny and, and kind of charming and kind of sad when you think about it. So he's an interesting character in his own right. Besides being interesting, these protagonists do have character flaws. I mean, they're pretty much all noble and good and heroic, of course, but... They do have those flaws, you know, arrogance, uh, ruthlessness, uh, boringness, <laughs> that sort of thing. And it's something that I noticed a, a particular reviewer in Amazon didn't like uh, how, what a male chauvinist Kirian was. <laughs> oh, well, too bad. <laughs> the plots involve not only realistic Gilded Age tech, which is kind of cool, but also unrealistic stuff, fantasy stuff like supernatural phenomena. Um, you know, like uh, Curse of the Werewolf and so on, as you may guess from the moon themes and ancient legends that are very reminiscent of the Indiana Jones series, some which are kind of biblically based. The theme of the British-American War is very plausible, which is another good thing in the series' favor, because at the time, there was a lot of conflict, there was a lot of tension, and a lot of people speculated that the two countries would go to war. If things had gone out differently, they might have, and not become allies that they've been ever since. I love the historical characters, which is another good feature of steampunk, including Teddy Roosevelt, one of my favorite presidents. Bully! They mention Nikola Tesla, though he does not appear. Some of his technology is part of the book. And there's a number of turn-of-the-century Robert Barron types, uh, including Rockefeller, Astor, Carnegie, and Morgan. And these are also kind of nuanced characters because they're greedy and kind of imperialistic, but at the same time, some of them realize that they have to sort of tone it down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of this exploitation may have gone a little bit too far. The religious subtext is a very appropriate one for the time, and it's a little refreshing. And that's something that you didn't see in Mopo, for example. At the time, the majority of Americans went to church, and they considered themselves Christians. And though I'm personally not religious, I find it refreshing when the author doesn't shy away from this. He doesn't try to impose 21st century skepticism on his uh, very early 20th century character. Despite Watts' Bible quoting and his kind of very 
Christian uh, outlook on things, which was, again, very common for scientific characters of the time, it's not the judgmental sort that you would expect in, for example, explicitly Christian fiction. In fact, in the third book, there are these three sisters who are spiritualists, and they are portrayed very sympathetically. So it's not like, oh, these are pagan, evil spawn of Satan. No, they have their own way. They have their own truth. And I like that a lot. And it also drives the time because the people in that time were very into spiritualism, into uh, contacting the dead with mediums, into spirit photography, fairies, and all that good stuff. Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was very into that, for example. And a num number of the other famous authors were. Of course, there's the action. <laughs> lots of gizmos, lots of firefights, lots of uh, daring do, as, as they like to say in the book, and a lot of harrowing danger. And the kind of ser sinister conspiracies that we also find in Mopo. So in this sense, the two are very much the same. And as far as the conspiracies go, this is probably the biggest point of commonality besides the male-female protagonist formula is that there is also this very long-lived, very sinister, very Machiavellian organization uh, that is behind the scenes and stirring up trouble. So this is something that he may need to change up a little bit occasionally as, as he writes more books about this. We'll see. Anyway, cons. The first and most major con to me is the name. <laughs> I just don't care for the acronym. I find it a little silly. But, you know, it's it's different. It's, it's okay. I, I, I kind of got used to it after a while. His writing is not as polished as Ballantyne and Morris's. That's understandable. This is his first offering, uh, his first three offerings, let's say. So uh, we can see that. It's, it, the pacing isn't quite as good. You know, the, the characters aren't quite as finely polished and all, all that. It's kind of hard to put my finger on it. But nonetheless, considering he's just started out, it's understandable. Some of the dialogue is really corny and, and cringy, in fact, uh, especially Emma. She has these two exclamations, she always says, by the stars and stripes. And her other favorite is Mother Freedom's Bells. <laughs> so, although I cringe when I hear them at the same time, the same kind of, kind of fits. It hasn't gotten to the point where, like Scott Westerfeld's Leviathan series, where the lead character would say, barking spiders all the time, to the point where I wanted her to shut up. <laughs> uh, another con is that the evil characters are very evil, so there's not much complexity in them. It is kind of common for the genre, and particularly common for Victorian fiction. Still, it's something, again, he could work on a little bit in future books, have a little bit more nuance. You know, I kind of like when you don't know for sure whether a character is good or evil. Although he does kind of mislead us at times. Uh, perhaps not as skillfully as other writers have done so, but still, I appreciate the effort. RE7's amazing abilities can sometimes be a little bit of a deus ex machina. I mean, they can get the characters out of a jam that you didn't expect because, oh, all of a sudden he can do this, he can do that. And that's something that could be a problem if it's overused. Finally, some of the Amazon reviewers complained about the cliffhanger at the end of book one. And I was thinking, what's the problem with cliffhangers? I mean, I like them. But then when I considered that the second book came out three years later, <laughs> I realized that, yeah, they had a legitimate complaint. At the same time, since there was a three-year gap between those two, I'm hoping that this means that perhaps Murphy will, at some point soon, give us another one. Now, despite these flaws, and they're not that bad, any of them, I enjoyed these books thoroughly. I think he's worked really hard. He, he acknowledges a lot of uh, friends and associates who helped him polish his work, which is always a good thing. It's always good to have beta readers and uh, sometimes other writers uh, to consider what your issues are and how you can improve. And uh, I enjoyed all these books thoroughly. 
I actually wouldn't mind it if they'd been a little bit longer and gone into a little bit more detail, a little bit more local lore. So I'm always enjoying that sort of thing. I would rate it 4.5 out of 5 gears. Extremely good, with a lot of potential. Perhaps it could even supplant Mopo as my favorite steampunk series ever. You know, considering how many he writes and in what direction he goes. This has been my review of the Steam Cap series by J.T. Murphy. Please let me know what you think about that in the comments below. And also, I always appreciate the suggestions. I have been reading them. I will do some more history at some point, historical fiction, although I haven't quite decided which type, realistic historical fiction or alternate history. Also, please like and subscribe. It helps us get out the good steampunk slash sci-fi word. I do appreciate that. Also, check out my books on Amazon. I'll have the links in the description. For now, this is Steampunk Dust Brother saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Dust Brother channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Mm -hmm.